Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Hobo Connect Ask the Experts webinar. Um, we're going to give folks a minute or two more to join, and then we'll kick things off at 2.02. All right, welcome again to those who've joined in the last few minutes. We'll go ahead and kick things off. Um, welcome to the Hobo Connect Ask the Experts webinar. In terms of a few logistics to get us started, if you can't hear me, please be sure to check your audio settings in the GoToWebinar panel. This webinar will last approximately 45 minutes. And we welcome you to enter questions in the question area of the GoToWebinar panel. We'll try to answer those as we go through this presentation. And we've also left some time at the end to come back and answer any questions that we didn't get a chance to. And lastly, please note that this webinar is being recorded and it will be made available to attendees after the webinar wraps up. Um, today we have with us myself and Mike Delellis, our tech support manager. Mike, would you like to introduce yourself to the group today? Yes, thank you, Sierra. Hi, uh, everybody. My name is Mike Delellis. I am the technical support manager for the Hobo Group. Um, I've been with Onset now for 18 years. Um, actually, I started my career at Onset uh, in the shipping and receiving departments, quickly moved into production where I built data loggers. Uh, and then for a number of years, I stayed into the, the repair department where I got to fix a lot of uh, broken things that came back. And uh, since 2007, I've been with the support team. Great. Thanks, Mike. It's great to have you with us. I'm sure many of you guys have sent Mike your questions, and he's been super helpful in answering them. Uh, I'm Sierra okay. Brandt. I'm the Hobo Software Product Manager. So I manage HoboWare, Hobo Connect, which we'll talk about today, and Hobo Link. I've been with Onset for about a year and a half now, and my focus since I joined Onset has really been about improving our software offerings to make our products easier and quicker to use. In terms of an agenda today, we just wrapped up logistics and introduction, and we will split the remaining time into three parts. This webinar is really a response to a very popular webinar we gave last year, reintroducing Hobo Connect and running through many design improvements that we had made to the app. Uh, people really enjoyed that webinar, and I uh, recommend that you check it out. It's available on our website. Um, but some of the response we got back is, we love the webinar, but we'd like to see some more tips for managing your data loggers um, and the data that you get from those loggers. So we uh, prepared today's webinar. We'll spend um, part of it walking through some best practices and tips for managing your loggers and the data that you get from them. Then we'll answer some of the most common questions we get about MX Bluetooth data loggers and Hobo Connect. And we'll wrap up um, with some time to take more of your questions, um, which please feel free to drop those in the question box for the GoToWebinar menu. We'll just come back and take a look at those. So you can break the life cycle of an MX uh, Bluetooth data logger into six steps, unboxing, installing Hobo Connect, configuring and starting, 
downloading and exporting, sharing your data, and then deleting your files once you no longer need them. We're going to walk through each of these six steps today and talk about some helpful tips and best practices. So first up, we have unboxing. I don't think you guys need much help with the actual unboxing part, but I do want to point out that every Hobo logger is shipped with a quick start guide. Most of our MX Bluetooth loggers are going to come with a piece of paper that has a QR code or a URL that will take you over to our digital getting started MX data logger guide. This guide is going to walk you through the basic setup process and answer the most common questions we get about these loggers and Hobo Connect. So it's a really great resource as you get started. There were a few loggers in the MX logger uh, family that have some specific setup steps or some more intricate deployment. And so for those loggers, you'll still see a paper quick start guide in the box. So whether it's the digital guide or the paper guide, these are going to include some really helpful and important information for deploying your loggers and getting accurate data from them. So please make sure that you're reading this as you um, are unboxing any new logger that we ship to you. Next up, we'll have installing Hobo Connect. So Hobo Connect is the app that we've designed for use with our Bluetooth loggers. It only supports the Hobo Bluetooth loggers. If you're using our USB and optical products, you'll want to use HoboWare. And if you're using our connected products, our RX stations, you're going to want to use HoboLink. All of this is detailed on the product page at the very top. It'll give you a quick icon there to tell you which software you need for your logger. But if we're talking MX Bluetooth loggers, it's Hobo Connect. Uh, we offer Hobo Connect on a variety of platforms, so it's going to be the same feature set no matter which platform you use, but the install path will depend on the device that you're bringing. So if you want to use an iOS device, so that's your iPads and your iPhones, you're going to want to download that from the App Store. If you have an Android device, whether it's a mobile device or a tablet, you'll get that on the Google Play Store. And we currently offer um, two options for Windows devices. There's a direct download option directly from our website, and you can also install that from the Windows Store. All of these can be directly linked um, to from the Hobo Connect page on the onsetcomp.com website. So then that takes us to really getting up and running with your logger, and perhaps the most common question we get is, um, what do I need to do to start collecting data? So you do need to configure your data logger to start collecting data, and that's going to be done in Hobo Connect. So our Hobo products are really built with configurability in mind so that users can tailor data collection to their specific application. If you're new to data logging, uh, this can seem a little overwhelming at the beginning, but I want to assure you that it's really easy to get started. You really can do this in four simple steps, and if you want to start tailoring, we'll get to that next. But the simplest way to get up and running is to unbox your logger, install Hobo Connect, and then you're going to want to locate your logger in the list of devices. That list of devices is always going to be the screen that you see when you open Hobo Connect. Um, two tips here are you do need to be in Bluetooth range to see a device in the list of devices. So if you're located far away from the device, you're going to want to move closer. Also, some of our devices go into a sleep mode, um, so you may need to push a button on the logger if you are in Bluetooth range and you still don't see it in the list. Um, but once you've done that, it'll pop up into the list, and if you tap that logger tile, you'll move to the configure, or you'll move to the connected devices screen. So that's going to give you all the options that are available to that logger, and the configure and start option is always going to be in the top left since everyone needs to do this process to start all the loggers in the MX family. When you tap that tile, you get taken to the configure and start screen. So this screen has a whole bunch of options, but I do want to point out that we've already done the hard part of selecting all the most common defaults for each of the parameters that you see. So you really only need to update parameters um, that you want to adjust. And if you're looking to quickly get started, all I really recommend you do is give your logger a custom name to make it easy to identify in the app and later exports, and then go ahead and hit the Start button. That's really all you need to do to get up and running quickly with many of our loggers. Now, I know many of you will want to customize your setup, 
um, and we offer a lot of parameters to do that. We're going to walk through some of the most common options and the um, features that are common across our bloggers, uh, covering when you might want to use these settings. But we don't have time today to cover all the settings and all the various options. Um, so please, if you have questions, take a look at our website, blogger manuals, um, and the research that we offer, or give us a call and we can talk through some very specific questions about these. Um, but I think today's information will really give you a good basis to start understanding how you might adjust the logger settings to meet your specific application need. So below that name and group tile that we just mentioned that let you give your logger a custom name, you'll see a logger settings tile. This is going to set some global logger settings, such as when the logger starts collecting data, when it stops, how often data is collected, and it's going to apply to all the data channels for that logger, whether it's temperature, relative humidity, or pH. I'm going to walk you through um, the five major parameters on this screen, talking about when you might use certain configurations. So first up, you'll see the logging interval, and this is going to control how frequently the logger records data. We've added some canned options here from one minute up to one hour based on the most common selections that we see our users um, opting into. But you can always customize the logging interval anywhere from one second all the way up to 18 hours using the customize option here. Next up, we see um, a logging capacity field. Um, we get a fair number of questions about this one too. What exactly does this mean? So this is a calculated field that displays how, logger, how long your logger can log data based on some of the other selections you've made like logging interval. So it's generally a fairly accurate field, but there are two things to note. One is it doesn't take into account battery life. We, gener we spec our MX products at one year of battery life at one minute logging, and you can choose a lengthy logging interval and see quite a long logging capacity, but it is possible that your logger would run out of battery before you ever hit this capacity, so please keep that in mind. It also doesn't account for burst mode logging, which is an option that we offer. It's not uh, used all that often, but if you happen to be in, uh, setting up burst mode logging, uh, which is a way to collect more or less data under certain conditions. Well, we can't really predict how often your logger is going to enter that burst mode. And so you might see a lower or a higher capacity if you are using burst mode. Next up, we have the start logging option, which is going to control when the logger starts logging. The most common selection we see is on save. And so as soon as you save this configuration and hit the start button, your logger will start collecting data. Odd next interval is a pretty similar selection, but it's actually a really great way if you want to make sure that you're recording data at clean intervals. So on next interval is going to start collecting data at the top of the next interval. As an example, let's say you're logging data every hour and you were to hit start on your logger right now. The logger is going to start at the top of the next interval, so at 3 p.m., and then you're going to get a reading at 3 p.m., 4 p.m., 5 p.m., instead of at 2.13, 3.13, 4.14. So that can be a nice way to clean up your data if that's the kind of data that you're looking to collect. For loggers that do have a push button start mode, you'll see that as an option. That just means um, your logger is going to set their waiting after you've saved the configuration until you hit a button and then it'll immediately start collecting data. And lastly, we have the on date time option, which lets you enter a specific date and time for the logger to start logging. This is a really great option if you want to deploy multiple loggers and have them all start and stop at the same period. You don't need to make sure that you're hitting a button or saving them all or setting up the next interval. You can just enter an on date and time and they'll all start at the same point. As you can imagine, we also let you control when you stop logging. These are related to the memory capacity as well, so it's important to keep that in mind as you choose an option here. Option one, and the most common option we see people select, is never stop. So the logger is just going to keep logging data until it runs out of batteries or until you take an action. 
This will overwrite old data when the logger reaches memory capacity, so please keep that in mind. But if you're downloading data on a regular basis, that we'll get to that later, um, this can be, this is typically the option we see people select. If you want a fixed period of data collection, you can choose on date and time, which will stop at a specific date and time that you entered, or after, which lets you set a time period after which the logger will stop. So you can stop after one day, one week, one month, for example. And lastly, we have the opposite of the first setting. This will be a uh, stop when memory fills. So when the logger reaches its memory capacity, it will automatically stop collecting any new data. And the last section we'll cover for logger settings is logging mode. Um, so that you'll see two options here, the first of which fixed logging mode just says that the logger will regularly collect data at the interval you've entered um, in the logging interval section. It is required to be in fixed logging mode if you want to, <coughs> excuse me, if you want to collect any statistical information for your data channel. So if you want an average, a min, a max, you will need to be in fixed logging mode. That'll um, toggle on the statistics option that you see here. Um, and you can configure uh, any statistical option that you want. The last option that we have is first logging mode. So that lets you change the interval of your logger when the logger enters certain conditions. It's a pretty uncommon option for our users, but can be helpful if say you want to um, collect additional data when you're in a storm event, water level rises, you can enter first mode and then collect a lot more data. Um, so there are a lot of other options that you might see below logging mode in the logging settings panel. They tend to be related to the family of loggers that you're looking at. So you might um, see an option to enter a reference water level or turn on and off the LCD. And those are all going to show up below logging mode and are specific to the type of logger that you're using. Moving on to your data channels, you're going to see one tile per data channel. And each tile is going to give you some options for uh, configuration that are specific to that data channel. So here on the screen, we see an example of what this tile will look like for temperature channel, um, but it's pretty uh, reflective of what you'll see for any channel here. So in this section, you can give the channel a name and we'll use that through the app and in the exports to identify the data coming off of this data channel. You can toggle on and off logging, so you don't always have to log every data channel that's offered by a logger. And you can configure alarms here. If you're using an analog input, this is also where you're going to um, configure that analog input, and you'll see some settings specific to that. And then lastly, to wrap up the configuration process, you'll see a tile for alarm settings. So these are highly dependent on the type of logger that you have. Here I'm taking a screenshot from an indoor logger that supports audible alarms and also some configuration parameters about how long to show those alarms on the LCD screen. Now, if you're dealing with a water level logger that doesn't have an LCD screen, you won't see the same set, um, but any alarm settings that are offered will be in this setting. And lastly, it is important to note that these only come into play if you've configured alarms for one or more channels. Um, so that's a quick run through of some of the most important logger settings um, and data channel settings. Uh, once you've done your setup and you've tweaked it to your application, you'll hit the start button and that can save the configuration to the logger and uh, start the logger. It can seem like a lot of options, but I do want to remind you um, that for each of our loggers, we've set up the most common uh, selection by default. So you really only need to walk through and update the parameters that matter to you. We also save the configuration to the logger. So you really only need to tweak it the first time to match your use case. And whether you're using the same or a different device with Hobo Connect, we'll save that. Um, so there's no need to reset up your logger in the future. So that walks through configuration and start. Um, now we're going to shift gears over to Mike, and he's going to walk us through some deployment tips for how best to deploy your loggers. Awesome. Yes, uh, thank you, Sierra. Uh, great information um, uh, here uh, for a lot of you folks out there. And um, um, uh, Sierra, can you uh, uh, go to the next slide there? Yep, there we go. Perfect. Um, great. Oh, thank you. Um, 
So, yeah, so here's some deployment tips, uh, some general, um, uh, just some general tips for folks, uh, perhaps you're newer to using data loggers. And um, these are just some things that will help you get started. This is sort of, uh, consider this sort of the, uh, the actual physical use of the data loggers and not necessarily the configuration. Uh, so highly recommended uh, that you test the configuration uh, and the data collection before you actually deploy the device. Uh, this is, can be very simple. Uh, simply uh, configure the device. Uh, you can do this right at your desk. And uh, allow it to log for a little while, offload that. And what this does, this actually gets you to become a lot more familiar with the products, how they work, um, and what that data is going to look like, sort of in a, in a slightly controlled environment right at your desk, right? Uh, highly recommended uh, that you do that before you use them, uh, especially if you're a new user. If you're a veteran user and you've, you've done, this, uh, done this quite a bit, perhaps you can skip this step. But for new users, I would uh, highly recommend it. Um, always refer to the Quick Start Guides and Logger Manuals. They include a ton of great information. Um, I wouldn't necessarily uh, recommend that you read them uh, back to front, but use them to uh, refer to uh, if you have any questions. Uh, and of course, if the question in there, uh, if you don't, um, if you can't find the information you're looking for, you can always contact uh, the support department. We'll be happy to help you out with that. Just a couple more points for indoor type deployments. These are devices that would be used in like your, uh, perhaps a manufacturing facility, an office building, uh, things like that where you have a controlled environment, non-condensing. Um, so one of the things, if you are looking to sort of get a temperature profile of a particular area, you wanna make sure that you keep away from uh, heating vents or AC units, right? So you don't want those directly next to or above or below those types of um, those types of things, uh, and the reason being is that because you're so close, you will um, uh, you, you may not get quite accurate data of what uh, the human experience might be in that room, uh, and the reason being just because it's so close, you're gonna uh, that when the heat turns on, it's gonna influence that logger um, quite a bit, and the same thing if the AC runs. Uh, in my experience, um, if if you're in a public area then uh, you want to keep these devices uh, sort of uh, not hidden, but, um, but just in a place where uh, they will less likely be tampered with, um, out of sight, out of mind. Um, so that, uh, it's, it's, it's a good thing to sort of keep these out of folks' hands. Uh, if they're handled, uh, you'll notice even the data will change a little bit just by the heat of your hands. Uh, and, um, of course, you want to make sure that nobody will vandalize them either. Uh, People are often uh, drawn to LCD screens, and most of these loggers have LCD screens. So, um, so keep that uh, you know keep that in mind. And also um, consider um, vented lock boxes. You will you, you may be familiar with those for thermostats and things like that. If you don't want folks changing thermostats, you may put a lock box around it, and usually they're clear. You can pick those up at any local home goods or home uh, improvement type center. And uh, they're well, very inexpensive, uh, ranging anywhere from, uh, I think, $10 all the way up to maybe in the $100 range if you need a larger size. Uh, but very, uh, very good to deploy, especially those in those areas where there's going to be a lot of foot traffic. And uh, a few deployment tips for, for loggers that are used outside and underwater. Um, one big point here uh, that we get asked quite a bit in the support department uh, is um, so Bluetooth. So someone might call in and say, you know, they can't connect to their Bluetooth logger while the device is deployed. Uh, one of the first questions we ask, of course, is, you know, is that device deployed in a stream or is it underwater? Uh, the reason there is um, so RF, which is, you know, Bluetooth is an RF frequency. Um, they will not transmit very far underwater. So, um, so keep that in mind when you're deploying these devices. You may want to uh, keep them in a place that's easily accessible so that you can remove the loggers from the water uh, and then, you know, download that, um, that data quickly and then place that uh, device right back where, where it belongs. So, yep, just to keep that in mind. Also, for outdoor deployments, um, you, I highly recommend uh, for most of the loggers here to use a solar radiation shield. The solar radiation shield is a great tool. It's uh, it, what it does is it protects the loggers from direct sunlight. Uh, it's amazing. Even in the shade, um, just reflected sunlight will affect the the way these devices uh, work, and that's really for any measurement device uh, that's measuring temperature outside. The um, the the solar
the temperature readings. Uh, and of course, that's uh, you know not what you're trying to capture. You're, you're typically trying to capture the, the air temperature in that uh, in that particular area, right? So, highly recommend using the solar radiation shields. And uh, so here's another great point here for the MX2200 series. Uh, highly recommend using the rubber boot that comes with every one of these devices. Uh, about a year ago, we started uh, sending a rubber boot with all of the MX2200 series. That's actually the, uh, the 001 and the 002 series. The 03 and 04 had already had them. Uh, but what this does is it allows you to securely mount that logger to uh, a number of different types of services, uh, services with um, uh, with a number of different types of uh, the tooling, right? So you could uh, zip these into a wooden post uh, with a screw, or you can even use a zip tie. And what that allows you to do is really tighten down on that boot and not have to worry about any sort of deflection in the case. Uh, if, they're, if the case itself is flexed, uh, sometimes that can lead to water ingress. And of course, we don't want that. So the rubber boot is there. It's a great tool. Um, and all the, uh, as far as I know, a lot of the folks that have used this have had great success uh, using that boot. So highly recommended. And uh, lastly, on this slide for the MX 2001 loggers, we provide a two-inch grommet, uh, and what that does is it allows uh, the user to um, uh, to actually install that grommet over the data logger, and it uh, allows the vent of the logger, so the, where the barometric reading is, is taken. Uh, that is, it allows that to stay above the above the actual um, well itself, right? The well itself is gonna contain quite a bit of humidity. So when we add that grommet on top of there, then the barometric portion of that uh, stays quite a bit drier, which is good. Uh, in that, uh, if you use that grommet, you can, uh, uh, you can be sure that you're gonna get optimal performance with these devices. So again, that's a, it's a two inch grommet. It fits on your typical two inch well, which is uh, in my experience, the most common that folks use. And, uh, and it would fit uh, the, the well cap that we send uh, or that we sell will fit right on top of that. Um, I've also seen folks make their own well caps and they look, uh, they're very creative and they look really, uh, really well built. Uh, so that's fine too. Uh, but highly recommend that, especially if you're using a two inch well. Uh, so then, um, so just some best practices and uh, some helpful tips for the sort of general um, uh, data logger use, especially on the MX platform. Uh, so one thing I mentioned earlier is uh, so read all the quick start guides and logger manuals. And, uh, and you, like I said, you probably don't need to read those uh, to you know, front to back, uh, but definitely keep them for reference. They're great to have, and all of the manuals are available online. Uh, one thing to note, all loggers must be configured to start collecting data. Out of the box, uh, they will not really be on, they'll just be there. Uh, however, um, once you connect to them with the Hobo Connect app, uh, you go through that process that Sierra went through with you, and you can set these devices up and they'll start logging. If the logger has an LCD display, you'll see that turn on. Uh, and there's other options in there, by the way, where you can turn that LCD off if you, wish not, if you don't wish to see it. But uh, just uh, so be sure that you're always uh, when you remove these devices from the packaging and you want to start using them, be sure to configure them. And again, uh, test your loggers uh, uh, before you deploy them. So uh, you set up, set them up, with, like I said, on a, on, a, on a bench or anything like that where you can get a uh, just a good understanding of how they work. Uh, and then, of course, just a reminder, Bluetooth does not work underwater. Great. Thanks, Mike, for all that helpful info. So that takes us through the first half of the IMAX logger deployment lifecycle. That's really a lot of tips about how to manage your logger. As we move to the latter half of the life cycle, this is really going to be about how to get and manage data off of those loggers. So to retrieve data from our loggers, you're going to use the download data option. You might you know this also is read out if you've used some of our other products in the past. So you can quickly download data from any of our loggers using any device with Hobo Connect installed. And we've designed this process to be quick and easy. There are two ways to download data in the app, a traditional single download option, and we've recently added a bulk download option. You'll see that bulk options throughout the um, app has been a recent focus because we're really looking at speeding up your workflows um, using Hobo Connect. Um, so I want to walk through each of these options quickly, just pointing out how they work. 
Um, so the traditional method is going to be available on the same screen where you configure the logger. Remember, you tap the logger tile to connect, and then you'll hit this download data option. Um, that's going to run through a download process and then give you the option to export and share. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, but you can also use the new bulk download option that we've added. No need to connect to the logger. You'll see this on the devices tab in Hobo Connect. And that's the screen that Hobo Connect always um, uh, loads when you open the app. So if you hit bulk download, the, da the um, device tiles will update a bit and you can select anywhere from one to 20 of these tiles. Then click the download logger button at the end. That's gonna connect to each of these loggers, download files, and can be a really quick way to grab a bunch of data from all the loggers that are in Bluetooth range. So it is important to note a few things about this process. One is the speed of the process is directly related to the amount of data on your logger. So if you've been collecting for a few days, this process is going to be very quick. But if you've deployed for a long time, months, uh, this process can take a while just to pull data off the logger. The process is also impacted by the Bluetooth signal strength. Um, so if you're far away from the logger, that can create some problems, and we recommend that you move closer to the logger to speed up the process or potentially address any errors that you might run into. After downloading, your data files will be ready for export and sharing whenever you are. Um, you should keep in mind that sharing requires an internet connection and will use data, so please make sure you're ready before you enter, ready to do that before you enter the export and share flows. So export is the process that will take the data downloaded from the logger and transform it into a file format that you can save and use in other programs. We currently support Excel, CSV, a PNG image format if, you are, if you've opened a data file and are looking at the graph, as well as a Hobo format that can be imported into our Hoboware platform. You'll be prompted to export and share when you download a file, or you can also download our, you can also export and share from the data tab. We've recently added a bulk option there too, which you'll see on the data files tab. When you've entered that mode, you can select up to 20 files at a time and use the bulk export and share option. You'll see us run through the queue of the exports, and then you'll get the option to either quit the process or share really highly recommend that you share your files using this built-in share option if you're on a mobile device, as it can be a bit tricky to locate exports and saved files on iOS devices, and you really can't do this at all on an Android device due to Google's security policies. The exact share options that you see are dependent on the device that you're using and the apps that you have installed. The most common option is going to be emailing files either to yourself or to your colleagues, but I do want to point out that another great option is to share to a cloud storage system. So to a Google Drive, a Dropbox, a OneDrive, there are a lot of options out these and you're likely already using one in your institution. So if you have one of those apps installed on the same device as Hobo Connect, you'll see it in the share options menu that pops up when you hit the share button. You can click it and then it'll immediately send over files to that share option. So no need to email a file to yourself, download and then move it. You can just send it directly over to one of those apps if it's installed on the same device. And lastly, you do want to delete your files once you're done with them. It is important to note that Hobo Connect is not a long-term data storage option. You need to export and share your files regularly to a permanent share. And once you've done that, you're gonna to wanna to delete any files you no longer need. This is gonna clean up some space on your device and also clean up that data tab list of files, which can get pretty lengthy if you're downloading data from a lot of loggers regularly. The delete process is pretty simple. All you have to do is hit the trash can icon. This is gonna always be visible on a Windows machine and it'll be visible if you swipe left on a data file um, on a mobile device. We do give you a confirmation just to make sure you aren't deleting things accidentally, um, but do wanna, uh, 
you know, really hammer home here that you should be exporting and sharing data to a permanent data file storage system frequently. And then you can clean up and delete your old files when you're done with them. So to just reiterate some of the uh, most important best practices for managing your data, you do need to be in Bluetooth range for download, and you might need to move closer if you're having issues with downloading. Bluetooth doesn't travel through water, so you will need to pull up our water loggers out of the water to use any of these options. We've added a number of bulk options throughout the download, export, and share workflows to really help you speed up that process. Please make sure you're exporting and sharing your files frequently. And sharing to a share drive option is a great way to easily back up your files. So now we've walked through the workflow for an MX uh, deployment. And now we wanted to spend a little bit of time answering the most common questions and giving you a few other tips. Um, so Mike, would you like to walk us through these questions? Yes, I sure will. And thank you again, Sierra, for more helpful information. Um, so actually, uh, I was actually just answering uh, this question on uh, the chat, believe it or not. <laughs> uh, so how do I switch units? Um, so uh, this is a common question that we get in tech support. Um, so here, it's actually a, a sort of a global setting, right? So you can actually change this um, right in your uh, user settings. You can actually select US, so this is um, uh, you know temperature Fahrenheit or inches, uh, inches or feet. Uh, or you can select SI, that's your scientific type unit, so degrees Celsius. Uh, or centimeters or things like that, right? So um, uh, so you can change that uh, in the app and uh, there's no real need to configure the device as it is an app-based setting. And this uh, next slide here, how do I delete, erase, or clear the data from my logger? Uh, this is a very common question. And I, as I mentioned earlier, I've been here for uh, uh, at onset for 18 years, and uh, from uh, when I started in the support department, I think this was the first question I ever got. Um, so, uh, just a, it, the 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 memory itself. So, downloading the logger, uh, downloading that data from the logger, will not delete the data uh, from the memory. Uh, so, uh, in fact, the data is never actually there's no real delete function uh, in the the typical data logger. Um, however, when you when you reconfigure the logger. What that does is that just goes back and it, it tells the memory to sort of uh, start at zero and then overwrite all of the old data. Um, so once you go through that reconfiguration process, the, um, the that older data then at that point is it's just no longer available. Uh, it's not accessible. Um, and um, so uh, there are some safety nets, of course, because uh, that that can sort of be scary, a scary sounding, right? So the, the Hobo Connect has some safety nets in uh, place where it will prompt you to make sure you download the data before you reconfigure. So there's a big warning message uh, that, about that. And uh, if that data is valuable, heed that warning and, uh, and go ahead and offload that data first. Um, <clears throat> another common question that we get um, is, do I need to calibrate my logger? Uh, and for the most part, the answer is no. Hobo data loggers, they're designed and they're built with precision components. And what we do here at the factory when we build these, uh, we put them all through stringent, stringent testing so that we know these devices when they ship are within those advertised specifications that we have for you on the website. Um, so uh, the, you don't really need a calibration in the traditional sense. Um, oftentimes, calibration is also uh, referred to for uh, our, our NIST certification program where someone may ask us, uh, you know, can I send these in for calibration? Uh, and we would offer this. This is a NIST certification. Uh, and what we do is we compare this uh, to a NIST traceable probe and we offer you whatever offset the data logger might be um, uh, compared to that uh, the super uh, high accuracy gold standard type device. Um, a couple of exceptions I did want to point out. So the MX2501, and that's our pH logger. Uh, so that's a little bit uh, uh, different of a measurement, very much different than temp and RH. Um, so this does require some calibration on the user's behalf. We have some calibration kits that you can purchase. There's a single point calibration and there's the um, a three point calibration, uh, which you can do. And really what you're doing is you're going through uh, a few different pH levels with, um, they call them uh, pH buffers, which are sort of standardized. And you'd go through that and you'd, the, the logger at that point would, would um, uh, sort of acclimate to those, acclimate and calibrate to those standards that you're using. Also, the MX1102A, uh, the CO2 channel does require calibration. 
And um, there's two processes there. One is a manual calibration where you would go ahead and configure that device. And during that process, you're going to go through the, the actual calibration. Uh, and we recommend in that case, uh, actually with the, with the CO2 logger, uh, you do that uh, outside, right? So uh, you want to get uh, to a position where you're at the lowest uh, CO2 that you can be for that calibration. Then there's also an auto cal setting that you can uh, that you can run, and I, I believe it's every week or every eight days. It goes through this auto cal celebrate or um, uh, process where it then will uh, uh, just basically go through there, do a little bit of math, and auto calibrate uh, at that time period. And how do I set a the reference level for an MX 2001? This is a we get this question uh, quite a bit in the um, uh, in the support group here. Uh, now the app part is uh, is really easy. You can see in this image here the reference level there. Is you can actually click on that, enter in your reference level. Uh, so that part, you know, that's that once you've determined the number that you need to reference here, uh, then it's very easy to enter that in here. Um, one of the challenges is determining how to do that. And there's a few different ways to go about it. And it really depends on, you know, really what your goal is and what, what you're trying to uh, measure against. So uh, just some considerations um, through experience over the years. The uh, uh, one way to do this is from a, a surveyed sea level comparison, right? So one might be, um, let's just say for sake of example, at uh, 500 feet above sea level. Um, However, they, um, they do want to reference this probe against sea level, right? So they're going to add 500 feet to their measurement uh, and then subtract uh, whatever number from the ground surface to the actual water level, right? So uh, let's say that, that that distance from the ground level to the water level is 10 feet. So you would then enter there uh, 490 feet as your reference level. Um, a distance from a stationary object um, for sort of flood control, folks might be using that. Um, maybe it's the distance um, uh, where uh, the distance from the water height to the bottom of a bridge. Uh, perhaps someone is interested in knowing that. Uh, and in a situation like that, you would so measure that distance. You would reference the time, uh, and you can do all this in the the application. Uh, and then this is a, an interesting um, one where you would actually enter that in as a negative number, right? So that would uh, what that would uh, show you as the water level increased, then the distance that you're referencing would then decrease, right? So as that water level increased, the distance between the bottom of the bridge and the water level uh, would um, would actually decrease there, right? So that's why you would enter for a negative number, sort of inverses the um, the way the the data is displayed. Uh, and then one of your simplest ways, of course, is referencing to ground level. And this is uh, in, in the, probably the simplest method of this is, uh, is taking a, um, uh, a stick ruler or, or a yardstick and um, just measuring down to your, um, your water level from uh, your ground level. Uh, it could also be the, the well height as well, which might be above ground level. Um, and then you would just um, enter that number. Uh, in that time that you took that reference uh, into this uh, into the app or the Hubble Connect application here. Uh, one more question here that we often get um, is how many loggers do I need for my facility? Uh, and this is a great question, and um, there's no real um, easy answer to this, um, but I certainly can give you give you some uh, things to consider as you're making this decision. Uh, so one thing to know. Uh, and this is again, this is this would be for an indoor facility, uh, so like a factory or an office or thing, something like that. Uh, airflow uh, that matters quite a bit, and um, so the better the airflow, uh, then the fewer devices you may need. And the reason for that, so the, the better your airflow, uh, typically the more even your temperature will be within that facility. Uh, it's not always the case. Sometimes that airflow is uh, outside influence, right? So you have to make that decision. Um, but for the most part, if you have a, a, a great, a good amount of ventilation in there, uh, then you then you probably have good airflow, and you probably can go with fewer devices. Uh, another point: so a small room may only need one logger. So think uh, maybe a typical conference room, a smaller conference room where folks are sitting. Uh, you may only need one logger there. Um, now, if it's a larger uh, convention type place, you're probably going to need a few. Um, but um, you know, really, the size uh, sort of de uh, the, the size of that room will depend on how many loggers you need. And again, uh, to reiterate, there's no easy answer to it. Um, and sometimes it even takes a little bit of trial and error to really figure out what you need. Large open rooms, uh, you know, may uh, need more to really fully understand the conditions. 
Uh, you may want one on every wall. Uh, if it's a really large facility, you may want one. You may you may need a few points throughout the entire factory uh, or area facility to uh, to really truly get a, a good idea of what the air temperature and, and conditions are in that area. Um, and uh, last point here: deploy near problem areas uh, or areas of interest. And um, this is uh, for any. I don't know. If, I'm not sure if we have any facilities, uh, folks here, but. Uh, oftentimes you may, uh, you know, get complaints from certain folks that have, uh, whether it's too cold or too hot in a certain uh, area of the office. Um, so you want to, um, you know, favor those areas if you really need to know, right? So that way, you know, if there is a complaint, you'll know exactly what the temperature is and you can sort of make decisions based on, you know, the person that's, um, you know, that's interested in this and uh, the actual data itself. Great. Thanks so much, Mike. I think there's a lot of great info in that. It's definitely, uh, a lot of the common questions that we get and the answers that we typically give out. Um, I think moving on, uh, I know we're about out of time, but I think you and I don't mind sticking around for a few more minutes and we can take a stab at some of the questions that were entered by audience members as we walked through this. Um, so I'll say we're going to stick around, we're going to answer some questions, but if we don't happen to get to yours or if your question's a pretty specific question about um, sort of the nitty gritty details of an application and we don't get to it today, don't worry, we recorded your name and we'll have someone reach out to you afterwards. Uh, but taking a quick look, it looks like we have a few questions around what, uh, you know, how far does Bluetooth reach? So I think this is commonly sort of spec that. Uh, I'll take a stab at this mic and you can fill in any details sure. if you have them. Um, I think Bluetooth is commonly spec that about 100 feet. But this is really going to depend on what that 100 feet looks like. Uh, open fields or big room, 100 feet, no problem. But if you're going through walls, if you're on a different floor, there are trees in the way, you might not hit that 100 foot mark and you will want to move closer to your logger to configure it, to take a look at it, to download any data from it. Exactly, Sarah. And uh, just maybe something to add to that too. Um, so there's a couple of things that really sort of impede how far um, uh, you know, radio signals can travel. Um, so number one is, uh, is metal. So if there's any metal facilities, um, some folks use these devices in refrigerators, which of course have a metal casing. That will gr greatly reduce uh, the distance you can um, achieve in that connection. Um, but also high moisture as well. Again, uh, going back to the Bluetooth doesn't work in water. And, um, uh, so anything like dense vegetation, so if you're using these devices outside, uh, dense vegetation could really uh, impede how far that can go. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think there was one comment by a user who's deployed them in a large snowbank and is seeing some um, decreased signal, and I think that aligns just with what you were saying, that really the conditions can impact whether you hit that 100-foot mark or not. Um, moving on to a few other questions. I see people asking a few questions about the delete process. So first of all, is delete permanent or can I get back my files um, if I accidentally delete them? So you do need to be careful here. We give you a confirmation box that really asks you if you want to delete and tells you that they are deleted permanently. And if you move forward, well, then it's gone. So please make sure you are exporting and sharing before you hit that delete option. I also saw a question about if we have a bulk delete mode. Um, ability to, you know, say delete more than one file at a time. So right now we don't, but I think that's a great suggestion. We have been focused on adding some bulk actions to make it easier to manage our loggers and our data. So I'll definitely be writing that down as a feature request. I think that's a great idea to give you the ability to delete uh, one or more files from the app. Um, so Sierra, there's a question here. Um from uh, Danielle, so um, uh, this this question, so when you download the data, will it capture from the last time you downloaded? Um, so yeah, it actually, um, and then um, just to expand on that, um, do you need to stop the logger and reconfigure and start? So Danielle, yes, the, uh, so actually both, right? So you can, uh, there's two ways to sort of manage your data files uh, as, as you're downloading. So one is uh, to configure uh, the device, go, uh, then you set it out in the field, you go out to the field to retrieve that data, then you can stop it and reconfigure it and then create a new data file. However, these data loggers have quite a bit of memory uh, and the batteries last for quite a while. So you could at the same, um, at that same site visit, go ahead and 
allow that device to continue logging. So what would happen in that case is then when you went out the second time for a site visit to retrieve that data, you would offload the data that you had already offloaded plus anything that had been logged after that point. Um, and there's a use case for both. Um, I think, you know, MX2001 users tend to um, offload and then stop and reconfigure, whereas, you know, maybe the MX2300 uh, users, maybe they're doing soil moisture, they may not need to do that. Maybe they just want to go ahead at the end of the year, have a, uh, a full file, right? So it sort of depends on what you want there. Great. Thanks for that info, Mike. Um, and one more question I'll throw your way. We did get a question about what to do to get your logger back up and running after you replace the batteries. Can you walk us through some helpful tips there? I know that's a question we get from a fair number of users. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, a very popular question um, uh, in the support uh, department. So, um, so you know, like all battery, battery powered devices, at some point you will need to replace these batteries. Um, so your steps there, uh, of course, um, if you do have some battery power left, you know, offload that data logger uh, and stop. Now, once you've gotten to that point where the logger is stopped, you want to remove the batteries and then uh, you know, replace with new fresh batteries. Uh, now, this is the next part is very important. Once you replace those batteries, the logger itself will do nothing. You do have to go ahead and connect to it just as if you're opening it new in the box. You do have to connect to it uh, and then go through the configuration process. Now, the good news is, is all of those uh, configurations that you've made, uh, ha they stuck, right? So they're there. So most of the time you just have to connect to it, uh, hit the configure button, and then just review your settings to make sure they still make sense, uh, and then go ahead and hit the start button. Great. Thanks for that. Uh, I see a few questions about the MX2001. That's our water level logger. About exactly where the Bluetooth sensor is um, located and whether you need to pull those up to download. I think that's a it's a good question in the weeds about you know how these lockers work. So would you mind taking a stab at that, Mike? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. No. Actually, we had a few of those questions in here. And um, so uh, on the 2001 system, there's two parts. Uh, there's the the top head unit, and that's where really all the brains are. That's where the memory is, uh, and that's uh, that is where and then the important part is that's where the Bluetooth antenna is. The second part of that, of course, is the sensor, uh, and it's connected by a long cable. And um, so the the MX2001 uh, top, that's the, the head portion of that, um, that should always be above water. So in that case, uh, you know, so water is not going to be your issue there. Um, now, one of the things you may need to consider if you're using a steel well, um, which the most, most wells that we deal with now are usually plastic, but uh, every now and then I do see a steel well. In that case, because it's metal, you may have some issues connecting. Um, so all you have to do there is pop off your well cap, pull out the logger just a little bit, and then you can go ahead and, uh, and offload that data. Great, yeah, I think that's a good question to clarify, especially since we gave people a lot of tips about pulling them out of the water. So uh, I think we can shift gears and I can take a few questions about software features. So did you see a question about um, whether any cable is required for use with our MX Bluetooth loggers. So I do want to uh, make sure that you guys all walk away understanding it's, it's a Bluetooth connection only. So you don't need to use a cable. All you need to do is install Hobo Connect. You may need to hit a button to wake up your logger, um, but there's no need to plug it in. Um, and I think it's a really great enhancement on our older product lines. Um, no cords, and you really just need to be in Bluetooth range to either configure, take a look at the data, or download that data. I think we can all uh, get rid of some of those cords that are hanging out in the box at our house when we move to some products like this. And I also saw a question about wanting to download data from loggers, one in Celsius and one in Fahrenheit. Um, so I think Happy to answer that question. I will say that this might be a little bit of a process because that's not really a typical request we get. Most people want to get um, consistent data across our loggers, and that's really what the app is built for. But if you did want to uh, download one file as Celsius and one file as Fahrenheit, you're just going to want to use that um, uh, SIUS toggle, um, choose the option you want, download the data, and then switch to the other option to change the units there.
let's see if you could probably find one or two more and then wrap up this webinar today. Sure, sure, Sierra. I just wanted to, um, um, there was a user here that was asking, uh, they used the MX1101, and is there a light uh, level that's going to be added to that device? Um, so, no, uh, not likely on the MX1101. However, we do have the MX1104 um, device, which, uh, which actually does have a, uh, a light sensor on there. I hope that answers your question. All right, great. And I think last question for today, just to kind of hammer this home, uh, I did see a question about where's the configuration button located on the sensor, on the logger, or on the app. And just to hammer that point home, uh, configuration of our loggers and really getting da data at all from these loggers requires the Hobo Connect app. Um, you'll want to connect to that, go through the configure and start process. Um, and Perhaps uh, this person missed the beginning of the webinar, but we'll be sending it out afterwards and you can review all the helpful tips that we went through today. Um, so I think that's a, a good stab and I know we're running out of time uh, for this webinar. So I'll pop back over and just point out some additional resources that we have here. Um, so onsetconf.com is our main website that really offers some full product details. There's a Hobo Connect page that you'll find in the software section. Um, there's also a documentation tab on all of our logger product pages. This is gonna tell you what software to use. It's gonna explain which features these loggers have um, and it can be a really great place to start answering your questions. Again, as Mike said before, uh, it's not a novel. You don't need to read it back to front, but it's really great reference material for answering your questions. Um, we also send out a lot of helpful tips and offer webinars like this through the newsletter. So please feel free to sign up for updates. And lastly, if you have some other suggestions or requests for webinars, please feel free to put those in the response for the survey that you'll get about this webinar. Uh, really do look at those as we set the webinar schedule. So I'll wrap up here by saying uh, thank you for joining me today. I hope you found this to be helpful. Um, and if we didn't get to your question or you have one afterwards, we'll follow up. And you can also always reach out to us and we'll have either technical support or our great application um, specialist team reach out to you and can really talk through the questions you have about our products and how best to use them. So thanks for joining me and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.